All righty. And you're recording this? Yeah, it's all pre-record, yeah. Um, just just to start, just give us a rundown on, on your musical background before before Matt finish. Before Matt finish, well, when I was 11 years old, my father was given uh, a, a couple of tickets to a rock concert um, from a, um, a mate and he gave them to me and my brother and said, are you kids interested in Led Zeppelin? And, and our jaws dropped and so we went to the showground and watched the most amazing um, uh, rock concert um, at... Uh, uh, <laughs> we actually got there early and we were standing right in front of the stage. Our hands were on the front of the stage, but we had to go away and relieve ourselves and have something to eat. And by the time we came back, uh, the place was full. I think there was 40,000 people there. And, and we were just little kids, and so we couldn't really get back in. And so we went and climbed on top of one of the pavilions that's now the Fox um, Films Production Studios and watched the show from there. It was just incredible. Wow. <laughs> now, you, you formed Matt, uh, with Matt Moffat, you formed uh, Matt Finish. How did you first both meet up? So I didn't quite hear that. Your first meeting with Matt Moffat, how did you first meet? Um, I was playing in a band with a guitarist called Al Taylor. The group was called Wade, and the singer was Wayne Jury, who's gone on to do some great things. Uh, he's living in Melbourne with Bob Spencer, uh, sorry, working with Bob Spencer, living in Melbourne. Um, and Matt actually came along to my gig and at French's Wine Bar in Oxford Street, Sydney, and we just got to chatting. I went down and saw him playing. He was playing in quite a funky sort of band. And uh, <clears throat> and we had a great time, but we both were in bands. And a couple of months later, come to it, we both weren't in bands, and I bumped into the drummer that he'd been working with, Terry Georgeson, at the One Trips Band concert, which was John McLaughlin's band, and uh, and the drummer was Tony, and, and and I said to Tony, you know, how's it going? And and he said, oh, I'm not working with Matt. You should work with him. And I said, oh, why? He said, oh, I just think you, you two would be really suited. You have both got similar sort of energy. And uh, and I said, oh, what's his phone number? And he said, well, he hasn't got a phone, but he lives in the first White House on the right in Pine Street, Manly. So I went along there and found the White House and went upstairs and knocked on the front door. And Matt was sitting inside, and he, and he said, come in, and so I walked in, and he was sitting on the lounge playing guitar, and he said, what took you so long? <laughs> like, there's no way he could have known I was coming. <laughs> That's the kind of guy he was. He was kind of a prescient sort of dude. Um, um, did that answer your question? Sorry, yeah. I always digress. No, it does. It's well documented. He, he was a pretty complex character, so that was apparent to you right from the beginning? Um, well, complex character. Um, well, I knew that he was an intelligent guy, and that was a sort of a fresh-faced, bright kid, you know. He was like, like a college kid, I guess, when I first met him. I was younger. Matt was four or five years older than me. Um, and, and I guess I was the dark, brooding one at that time, and, and Matt was actually a bright spark, you know, um, I guess I was the complex character back then, and, and he was actually just a really positive, forward-moving guy, but I think the industry took that out of him over a few years. Yeah. Did you have a, an initial blueprint for the, for the sound that you wanted for this band when, when you went about forming it? Yes. Um, we had our first jam together on my uh, 19th birthday. And um, and that had a bunch of fantastic original songs, um, conventionally written, um, mostly on the funky side. And and I loved it, but I was aware that the scene... I mean, you know, punk had just happened. Um, all the Aussie bands were rock blues bands. I'd been out and played on the circuit. Uh, around the circle, I should say, uh, and so, sorry, someone just knocked on my door, <laughs> right. um, uh, which broke my concentration, someone else is going to answer it, um, 
Sorry, what was the question? Remind me where we're at. Uh, the blueprint for the sound of the band. So Matt had a, a bunch of fantastic funky songs and we got in to rehearse the, the very first time and basically I just rearranged them all as rock songs. Uh-huh. So that was the blueprint to begin with. We had a lot of things that we agreed with. We were going for a minimalist sound. Mm. Um, Matt, um, you know, had a, a, a lyrical approach that was very distinctive of not really writing about specific things but rather about feelings and situations and having a little bit of fun with words. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we had quite a few things in mind, a minimalist, slightly jazz-tinged, rock sound that was intelligent but not complex, blah, 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 you know, we really <laughs> talked forever about it when we were kids. Yeah. Do you have memories of your first gig as Matt Finish? First gig with Matt Finish, yes, I can remember it very distinctly. It was downstairs at the Manly Vale. It was called the Piano Bar, I think. Um, and uh, we were supporting the Farris Brothers, who, of course, went on to be in excess. Uh-huh. Uh, and we just a little three-piece, and we'd invited this manager along, Peter Dawson, who was a wonderful man, and he had invited along an agent, Chris Plimmer, who had the Nucleus um, booking agency here in Sydney, which was the biggest agency in Australia at the time, and, and Chris said to us, you guys are great, um, how often do you want to work? And Matt and I looked at each other and, and laughed and said, eight days a week. <laughs> and... And we actually did. We, we, we actually did, um, you know, two gigs Friday, two gigs Saturday. We took Sunday off and then worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day, every week, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, I do remember that very first gig. I remember Michael Hutchins was dressed, um, you know, in black jeans and a, uh, sorry, black leather pants and uh, a white shirt and he, he had a white towel he jumped around the stage flicking the towel around looked fantastic <laughs> does it amaze you now that uh, here it is more than 30 years since your, your debut uh, and a band with I guess a relatively short lifespan in, in its initial form that you still have maintained such a following there's still such genuine interest in the band out there well I just think that's wonderful I mean we could have never foreseen that yeah. um, we did plan for it we, we, we were very aware that you know we didn't want to just be a one off Pop Wonder, we, that's why we um, turned down, you know, the requests to appear on Countdown and, and shows like that that were basically geared towards teenagers. I don't know if that's the right decision now, but and that's what we felt. We felt it would give the band longevity, that our songs weren't quite as repetitive as everybody else's and so forth, but you don't really know that back then. Um, it's magic that it's lasted. Yeah. You know, that people are still interested in, especially the song Short Note, but I think when we go and play live and, and work through, some, you know, all the popular songs, there's probably 10 or 12 that um, most people don't realise that they know. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's just a wonderful thing, of course, for people to enjoy our music. Sure. How would you describe Matt as, as a work colleague? Well, I'd have to draw a line and talk about two different people. Um, as I was saying earlier, the, the first few years, Matt and I, um, we just got on and did it. I mean, I'd ring in the moment I woke up and, and then he'd come around and pick me up and we'd go off and rehearse and go and see the agent and then we'd, you know, at the end of the night, one of them, he'd drop me off and you know, like I'd go in and an hour later he'd bring me and you know so we were just working on it the whole time and 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 we were just really keen we were just absolutely focused on having success we were doing it you know 24 hours a day and 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 Matt and I never ever disagreed musically if um there was something that I'd read about um a couple of uh, well-known film composers and and uh, one of them was a young young one being mentored by John Barry and uh, John Barry was a very famous English um, film composer and Zimmer was his young um, uh, protege and 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 they had an agreement you know, you know one was you know a multi-award winning 
producer and, and, and there was just a, a young guy. Um, they had an agreement that if any one of them didn't like the work of the other, they would just simply go and replace it and they would never ever argue about it or, or discuss it again. So here you've got this, you know, 25, 30 year old guy rewriting the, you know, passages of a film for one of the great masters of film scoring. But that was their agreement, and it was just a great way of doing things. And Matt and I talked about that, and, and that's sort of what we did. Mm. Um, so Matt and I had a great working relationship. We could just look at each other and break into triplets, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but obviously later on, things changed. Matt, you know, a lot of people got in Matt's ear about different things, and the whole power structure sort of shifted with, you know, these major companies. Um, coming in and uh, working with our music, um, and uh, and so things just changed over a period of time, and it, and, it, and it really is an awful situation for someone to be um, as loved and respected and admired as Matt, um, and to never get paid. You know, um, basically, it, it really eats into you, and so Matt's confidence really broken over the years. Yeah. Um, 1981, you know. We sold 50, 100,000 records and, and we didn't get paid. So 1982, we, we actually all fell to bits and got sick. 1983, we gave it another go and, and we sold another 100,000 records and, and we all came home sick and broke. And it was just so disheartening, you know, um, to keep doing it year after year. And I guess we both got to a point where we just had to stop thinking about it and doing it. It became like a, you know... It, it's just so weird to to explain what it's like to be so well known and and, and just not have any resources to do anything. Like you, you're borrowing money after the gig to catch a bus home. I mean, it really seems like madness. I know that it just yeah. ends up to so many musicians. Why? Why is that? And particularly at the same time, there's probably this outside perception to everybody looking in at you that you're rich and successful and living this wonderful life. I think that might be part of it, yeah. yeah. I hadn't, hadn't thought of that, but, but it's a, everyone else's perception that, that traps us in a bit of a, a tight spot, you know. Yeah. More than that, you know, it, it is convergent in the music industry. It, it was happening back then, and it's, you know, almost five-wise now with only a couple of major companies, and the people, you know, at the top of our industry have been the same since back in 1981, and, and, and you know, Matt and I only worked with, you know, the best, we, we went to the top, and and so, you know, I, I see it, I can see it quite clearly, the whole structure of our industry, the, ho the whole, you know, expectations that, well, that's what we're led to believe, we're, we're led to believe that, you know, you can have this success, you, you, you can be in this situation, but, but um, I really hope that one day the scene will change, I, I think a lot of people understand all of this now, and, you know, um, Obviously, the, the um, profit sources and everything are different now with the internet and uh, bands selling independently and, uh, and, and, and hopefully the, the power structure will shift so that musicians have a bit of a fairer chance in the future. Yeah. What are your memories of the uh, recording sessions of the Short Note album? Did you feel a confidence there that you're onto something pretty special? Um. Well, I guess um, I guess recording short note was like another gig for us. We, uh, I guess, the first year of the band, we just did every tiny little gig all over Sydney. But you know, when we got the record deal and and started uh, preparing for recording, um, we were pretty focused on what we wanted to do and we just rehearsed like crazy so when we went into the studio we really just did it like another gig we'd already had a taste of some really big shows supporting Midnight Oil playing at the last Double J concert um, panel on was I think 40,000 people out in the middle of the country so we'd had some really you know thrilling really exciting thrilling experiences and and um, and so we just put our heads down and played it we, we actually you know, set up and recorded on the first day and <clears throat> we've been feeling that it was the best that we had ever performed in, in, in our lives and, and we were pretty excited and the next day we went into the studio quite early and uh, we had to wait around because Kiss were in there. Huh. Uh, uh, they were 
touring Sydney, and so we saw them without their makeup, and it was quite uh, scary. <laughs> uh, and uh, and we turned up on the second morning, and, and the producer Peter Dawkins said, "Oh, um, guys, I've been listening to the tapes, and I really don't think you played very well. I think you need to go in and do the whole thing again." And I said, "What? <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> Are you kidding?" And the other guys in the band went, come on, John, we'll just go back in and do it. Well, he's the, he's the boss. So we went back in and we pulled it again. And I guess we all sort of doubted ourselves a bit because we all felt that we'd played so well the first day. So the second day, I guess, you know, the tempos were a bit different and short note sounds really short. It uh, sounds really slow to us. Mm. Um, but uh, anyway, that's, that's the story of short note. Um, it turns out that... Um, they actually accidentally wiped all the masters on the second morning just before we arrived. Oh, no. <laughs> so, um, short notes. Like, uh... um, the, the second album, Word of Mouth, was there a, did you feel a big weight of expectation on, on that record, considering the, the success and notoriety of the first, and then there was a break in proceedings for the band? Yes, we did. Um... We demoed it twice and then went and recorded it and then remixed it. And yes, I, th- I think we really did feel a bit of weight on our shoulders to do something special and that's what we did. Hmm. Yeah, Matt Finish was a band that never really was allowed any great continuity. It started and stopped r- right through its existence. Do you ever ponder what might have been had you been able to get a good good run at it? Oh, gee, if we'd have just got paid, we would have had a solid lineup, and it just would have been consistent all the time, and, you know, the band would get better every single night. But when you have lineup changes, it's it's uh, a lot of work to keep the band tight and keep the continuity. So, wow, I guess we would have been like you too, or Midnight Oil. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is it right that you, you looked after yourself the, the management and promotion of the band during a period in, in the 90s? Sorry, please say that again. Um, is it right that you looked after the, the management and promotion of the band for a period of time in, in the 90s? Um, yes. Yeah. I promoted um, a tour in 1990-91. Um, Matt had been in America for a few years. I'd been over and used some stuff with him. Um, then he came back to Australia in 1990 and, and, and we did uh, about 50 or 60 shows in a row and had a fantastic tour. It was really, really great. Um, that was a sign that we toured together. For personally, for yourself, though, how do you look back on that experience getting involved in, in the management and promotion side of things? Well, I guess I've always tried to be involved in that side of every project that um, that I've initiated. Um, we did have um, an agent, Chris Plimmer, who became Matt's personal manager in the 80s. Um, and uh, I would much rather someone else do it. Um, but I think every musician, every person, has to be somewhat responsible for, for their own, you know, situation and... And I think it's just part and parcel with the gig these days, yeah. you know. I think a lot more artists these days would be managing themselves. You mentioned that you worked with Matt on, on some solo material of his as well. Did you notice a difference in his approach in working with this sort of material than, than the band stuff? Oh, yes, very, very different. Um, Matt, by himself, tended to compose um, slower... Uh, more gentle and heartfelt, you could probably say introspective ballads. Um, and so when I went over to New York, most of the songs that, that I worked on uh, for his um, solo projects, they were never released, by the way, um, were were in that vein. Whereas the music in Matt Finish, Matt and I pretty much did it all together and I'm sort of an event-based composer, if that makes sense. Mm, um, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not your typical singer-songwriter. I don't necessarily start with lyrics. Um, and, and and I usually do start with a hook or a riff or a climax point that I have in mind. And, and I go for, you know, 
dramatic changes, whereas Matt tends to write a really beautiful song in one mood. Um, and I think you can sort of hear that in short note and word of mouth yeah. to to all, all, all the rest of the stuff. Is um, My music is more arranged and, and Matt's is definitely more, you know, the wonderful expression of a singer-songwriter. Matt's passing didn't uh, attract a lot of media attention. Was that a disappointment to you as a, a friend and colleague to see him gone without some due notoriety there? Well, it was shocking. I thought it was outrageous. Um, I, 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 must, I mean, the, Matt's actual funeral was very well attended. There was guys from, you know, heaps of other great bands, the Angels and Cold Chisel and uh, Midnight Oil, and there was people from um, Triple J radio station. And But, yeah, just in the media, there was only two of these that I came across, and uh, I... I guess I, I should have tried to do more myself to, to, to speak about Matt, but I was pretty upset and probably didn't really think of the right thing to do. Um, but, it, but, it, but about a year later, I set up the website, and that's really what I had in mind was a, a memorial to Matt, and, and the new band has really just grown from that. Yeah. So um, Matt was such, such such a wonderful talent. It, it, it really is it really is a great loss. So since then, uh, taking taking the band out without Matt, have you had to encounter criticism of people questioning uh, the validity of of, of, a, of a Matt finish without Matt Moffat? Yes, of course. Yeah. Of course, there, 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 there is one in a thousand um, <laughs> who feels you know strongly about Matt, and and um, and I'm with them. I wish Matt was still here too. Of course we do, yeah. Outside of the band, what would have been for you personally some of your proudest achievements in music outside of Matt Finish? Oh well, I've I've um, produced a couple of thousand um, uh, you know jingles and sound soundtracks for, for film and advertising. Um, I've had some great successes there. Things have gone right around the world year after year, and um, I uh, I produced an album called uh, Tibetan Prayer with a Tibetan singer called Young Chen, Young Chen Lamo, um, with a beautiful voice, and that won an Ari Award, and she, um, her album was picked up by Peter Gabriel's label, so that was a wonderful compliment. And mm. I guess one of the most exciting things for me um, <clears throat> was touring with Adrian Ballou in, um, it just five or six years ago. Yeah. Um, great challenge musically to play some of the music that I'd listened to when I was growing up and he's just such a eccentric and wonderfully <laughs> talented musician. It was an amazing challenge and I, I only had very short notice to learn the repertoire and, and then bang, we're on stage at the Blues Fest playing to 70,000 people. So it was just a really, really exciting um, month of touring. I imagine you would have to be really mentally alert to, to, to keep up with him on stage. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's just brilliant. He's he's, he's a one of a kind. He really is a little hillbilly guy. <laughs> I read another interview with you where you talked of some copyright issues in Canada. You encountered with the Matt Finish catalogue of songs. How did all that pan out in the end? What, what exactly was the issue? Well, it turned out in the mid eighties that none of our songs had been registered at APRA or that the registrations had been lost at APRA. Um, and then publishers um, signed it all over that. So, so I've been left out of publishing and I'm still chasing it. I'm, 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 I, I can't let it go. Yeah. Um, I don't have enough evidence to go to court so the statute of limitations hasn't run out. Um, and I'm just you know, waiting for an opportunity to, to state my claim in that regard. With recording royalties, well, we've never received a recording royalty from, from any of the companies that have been selling our music. Um, I recently uh, discussed it for the first time in public on Facebook. Uh, I put a couple of doc documents up and invited people to have a look at it and, and uh, just had a wonderful response from people. Um, it's... Uh, 
I don't know what else to say. It's yeah. pending. I, I really hope to resolve this in a court. Um, I mean, you know, even if I had the chance to settle outside of a court, I don't think I would now. I think it's just such an objectionable thing to do. Um, yeah. to, to deny a man that it's profits. And basically what's happened is one company sold it to another and in doing so, they've dropped off any sort of responsibility to pay the band, and they can't do that. <laughs> no. It's just that simple. They just, they don't own it. They don't have the right to do that. But but they have one, they have, have a document which says that, that they can, and at the moment, some lawyers think that that does give them the right, and some of the lawyers think that it doesn't. So, um, I'm trying to be diplomatic, but obviously, I, I think you can hear that, that I feel very strongly yeah. about it. it it's, 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 uh, it sounds like you're in for the long fight, anyway. I am. Yeah, I am. I'm. I'm. I'm uh, I try not to be emotional about it. I, I try not to get my hopes up. And I guess it's like watching a sequel. You know, Sherlock Holmes mystery for me. I just sit down and watch it and think, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what's going to happen next. You know. Mm. But, uh, sadly, though, it's not an uncommon tale. It, it's going on all around the world with uh, many bands. Well, I, I think um, in Australia, I, I was alluding to it earlier in the conversation, but there's one law firm here in Australia that represents a number of the um, large, um, you know, major corporation copy, um, copyright owners. Um, you know, they advise them about copyright matters. They actually handle the contracts. They store the contracts and so forth. And uh, and uh, I think that law firm has. Uh, got the wrong attitude. Uh, I think that's the nicest way to say it. Um, they just simply have the wrong ad attitude. Uh, they're, what they're doing isn't really legal, um, but because they are the strongest um, um, people in that area of the industry, well, they're kind of a bunch of cowboys. Yeah. So they do whatever they like. And unfortunately, that's always been the way here in Australia. If they have a look at you know the mining industry, for example, and the characters who are in the mining industry. There's only a few of them. There's only a few of them that have got right to the top and, and have billions of dollars of profit from their, you know, efforts. But, um, but but I think it's a similar situation in all industries these days. You know, you have a few billionaires, a couple of really big law firms, and, and then everybody else. Oh, well, we certainly hope you can fight your way through that one and you finally get what uh, what is most deserving to you. Thanks, John. <laughs> At the very least, it'll be a great challenge. Yes. <laughs> and just to wind up, John, what, what's keeping you busy these days and what are in your upcoming plans? Well, I guess I'm looking for the next, you know, big project to get my feet stuck into. I've got lots of albums to do. They're all low-budget, local um, albums with really, really talented people. Um, quite a number of them have been performing together um, at the Marigdor Bowling Club, Um uh, once a month with a gig that we call The Do and it's in a soul groove kind of vein um, and as I say I'm producing a number of those artists so um, there's Boof and Sophie Vaughan and uh, a band called People Like Us and um, Jeff Cartwright and Peter Fenwick and just a whole bunch of really really great singers and songwriters so fingers crossed we'll get something happening Fantastic and keep them busy. Okay, John, thanks so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure catching up with you. Thank you, John. I yeah. hope there's something of you there. Oh, there certainly is. There certainly is. And thanks for all the wonderful music over the years, and uh, we're sure there's still plenty more to come. Oh, thank you very much. Good on you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you, John. Okay, bye.